One of the hardest parts about buying small businesses is that we're dealing in the private capital markets. The private markets are private and opaque and fragmented, and it's really hard to get good data in terms of what's going on. So when we're making offers and negotiating, there's always going to be kind of a delay and, and a blind spot in terms of what we should be paying for this deal or, or whatever. So let's look at the empirical evidence and break down what's going on in the market here at the end of 2023 and what we saw this year and uh, as well as some predictions uh, moving forward. My name is Walker Dybel. I am the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of Buy Then Build and creator of the Elite Accelerator Acquisition Lab. Okay, um, Peter Lehrman is the founder of Axial. Okay, Axial, if you don't know, is a platform uh, where buyers and brokers and sellers can come together and um, talk, of, you know, list their businesses um, actively on market, right? And um, they've they've historically worked slightly up market in the, in the middle market. They started about I want to say 20, 2010, uh, right around there or so. And um, I admired them from afar for a long time, and, and uh, ultimately met Peter and um, uh, actually just had coffee with them a couple of weeks ago. Great guy. Um, I love what it is that they're doing over there. They recently came out with a report in terms of um, you know they 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 they, they did over five thousand phone calls to get the data to say like, all right, what are the big trends in the market? Okay, and they came up with four of them, all right? Um, number one uh, is the tightening of credit. So banks are sort of moving into risk off mode, right? Like as interest rates are going up and they probably have a lot of loans out there that they wanna make sure, you know, carry forward. A lot of them are in real estate, of course. There's a lot of bridge loans. Everyone thinks that, you know, there's a bunch of multifamily businesses, buildings that, you know, are going to go from the bridge loan to the long-term loan and, you know, the interest rate change will mess up their P&L and they'll have to, whatever. The point is, is they've been very risk on, uh, making it, you know, a lot of them have been very aggressive for, you know, a, a number of years. And with interest rates creating uncertainty and increased cost of capital, banks are being more conservative. They're tightening up right? And, and they're not quite as eager um, to, to lend on these things. And so, um, you know, like the, the, the bank last, you know, 2022 that was going to give you that loan, this year is a little more conservative. They're kind of cherry picking what they're doing, right? So it's harder um, to get capital in the uh, middle market. And by the way, the middle market is really that sort of like, some people say it starts at 25 million. Some people say it starts at 5 million. Some people even say it starts at like one or 2 million. I disagree with that. I think it's more like, you know, 20, 20 to sort of 250 million, something like that. And so, you know, um, the thing is, is you've got this space where, you know, the credit, credit is tightening up and it's getting harder to get um, deals done. Number two, um, elevated valuations versus asset quality that they called it, right? So, for years, I've been predicting that, you know, in this in this smaller, you know, let's just say, whatever, 10 million and below acquisitions, that, that valuations were gonna start to barbell out, right? Where, you know, the really good businesses were gonna sell at premiums and, and the sort of subpar businesses that still got deals done, you know, kind of fell maybe a standard deviation below and the average becomes sort of meaningless, okay? It was interesting to see that that's what, you know, Axial reported is happening this year, according to, you know, um, private equity, in, 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 you know, independent sponsors, um, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, search funds, other institutional buyers, just because um, they're seeing like, like the valuations are remaining high. And uh, if it's a good business, they're getting done. But um, those good businesses are getting a little bit harder to um, to come by. Um, in other words, it's a smaller percentage of the of the total deals that are sort of available uh, at market, right? And on the one hand, sellers, um, and I can speak from experience on this one, sellers are becoming much more conservative to going to market to sell their business, right? They're sort of saying, well, you know, valuations are down a little bit, terms are getting a little bit less favorable, I'll just kind of hold off because I don't want to do it. Or I've got this really good business and, and you know, maybe I had a little bit of a COVID bump and my business is sort of down. So I don't really want to sell right now. It's sort of a handicapped valuation. So a lot of sellers are choosing to sort of wait rather than go to market. On the other hand, buyers are, you know, being a lot more careful with what it is that they're sort of buying. And, and I actually think it's sort of related to the first thing, right? Like if I'm only going to be able to get one deal closed this quarter, because of the tightening credit market, I better I better take a good one to them, right? 
Now, here's the thing. Is this barbell happening now? This barbell in pricing that I sort of have predicted for years? Um, maybe, okay? But, but what I think is actually happening is that when interest rates were effectively zero and the stimulus pushed all kinds of money um, out into um, consumers' hands and, you know, uh, the government, you know, printed, uh, you know, 30% of all U.S. dollars ever in existence a couple of years ago, they just flooded the economy with so much money, okay, that um, uh, more deals were getting done, um, the, the valuations were getting run up because capital was so liquid and interest rates were at zero, right? And so when that happens, what happens to valuations is that people are much are willing to pay more than the fair market value at that time. And so it pulls them up over time, right? The opposite is sort of happening now where interest rates are, you know, they're, you know, they're no longer climbing. People are starting to think that they're gonna go down next year. I mean, it looks favorable, but that, you know, is it is it higher for longer? Are we even high? You know what I mean, whatever. But the point is, is there's there needs to kind of shake out a little bit. The interest rates are increasing the cost of capital and so those same buyers that sort of increased the purchase price of all the deals are now saying, look, I, I, like I've got this heavier cost of capital, I need to pay down here. And the sellers are just starting to kind of respond, but the, but the, the valuations haven't sort of you know, settled back down just yet, okay? Um, this is what um, um, I'm predicting from, from the sort of trends in the market, right? And so, you know, I think that, um, uh, I, you know, it might show that, that they're sort of starting to barbell, but I think that there's other things at play, namely, you know, interest rates and, and tightening of credit. Uh, number three was the increase in um, uh, d uh, high stru highly structured deals is what they called it, right? So, so basically this gap between, you know, the buyers are saying, look, I can pay this and the sellers are like, look, I need this to sell. If it's a good deal, if it's a quality deal, they're getting their price, okay? However, what we're seeing is this gap is getting closed with um, sellers that are more flexible in terms of deferred compensation, right? So um, we're seeing uh, an, an, an increased willingness from sellers in order to take seller notes and take earnouts in order to get a deal done in order to get that price, okay? Um, so if you take the sort of like 80-20 um, rule, okay, uh, buyers believe that uh, sellers are between five and 20% higher than what they're, what they're sort of willing to pay, right? Five to 20% higher. Um, and that gap is getting covered with um, seller financing in 56% of deals right now in, in, the, in the middle market, okay? And 36%, um, uh, so like a third of deals are introducing an earnout, okay? I wanna be very careful because there's a lot of noise on social media. When you hear that there's a seller note or an earnout involved, please understand that that does not mean that a seller is selling their business for you know 100% seller financing or 90% seller financing. That does happen like in the sort of like low, lower than a million dollar kind of situations. And you know, if you, if you sort of bottom feed on you know, death, disability, divorce, disease, you know, the, you know, the five Ds or whatever, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, the, you can find those sort of deals, but but the the private capital markets don't normally operate that way, right? Like it's it's um, you know, usually a, a seller note might be, you know, ten percent of a deal, maybe twenty percent of a deal, um, and earnout is usually uh, meant to cover two things: either a when the when a business is growing so fast that it needs to get this sort of valuation up here, and the and the buyer says I'll do it, but it's got to fulfill that, or second when a business is decreasing and the seller's like, no, look, it's flatlined out, we're good now. And the, the buyer's like, sure, we need to kind of prove that, you know, with, with, with these dollars. And that, that's usually when an earnout is sort of applied. But to, to see that 56% of deals or half of deals are not cash at closing, and, uh, or sorry, include seller financing is a, a more accurate way to say that. And 36% or a third are including earnouts. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty high number from my experience for, for earnouts. Um, fourth, you've got a surge in family offices and independent sponsorships in terms of buying deals, right? Um, Axial is uh, suggesting that this is because um, they, they have more flexible um, you know, investment theses and can sort of adjust to um, the market as the market moves. I agree with that. 
Um, I would also add that there's just been an incredible surge uh, in both family offices and um, especially independent sponsors in the, in the prior years. Family offices have sort of formed, um, you know, over the last decade to sort of address the sort of like, well, we're super loaded. We have, you know, over $50 million in, in sort of management. And so my kids don't really need to work. I'm, I'm making this up. My kids don't need to work and they all have MBAs from top universities. They're very well educated. They understand finance. Uh, we're just gonna go ahead and pull it internally and we're all gonna kind of work together and make very choice investments rather than, you know, give it to a hedge fund manager and we all sit at the club, right? So it gives them purpose. It gives them a vehicle um, and they save uh, the sort of management fees um, of the hedge funds and, you know, the two and 20 and whatever. Um, so it's, it's a really cool thing that, that really has picked up speed over the last decade. The independent sponsors, okay, are something that, so there's another term for independent sponsor, um, fundless sponsor. In other words, they don't have any money. Okay. This is that sort of, you know, like the acquisition entrepreneur in, in, in my book is that sort of like, you know, you know, one, you know, one to $5 million acquisition and an independent sponsor is really the same profile. You know, they want to put, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, t maybe 10, maybe, you know, one to 20% of their own money into a deal and, you know, buy, you know, take down a company that's, that's, that's a lot larger, but they're utilizing all kinds of different advancements in the capital stack in order to get these bigger deals done. Right. So, um, uh, you know, so, so there was a, a about a 25 to 30% surge in family office activity um, in the last two quarters. Um, and I'm, I'm estimating that on, on Axial's graph. And then there was a, uh, 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 a oh, a, there's about 4,000 active independent sponsors right now. So uh, that doubled over the last two quarters or the last six months. So uh, case in point, huge surge in independent sponsors as people are trying to go out and kind of create their own private equity um, companies. So listen, um, if you are interested in buying a business in the next, you know, one to 24 months, you should consider the acquisition lab. Um, we really set out to create, um, the, we were the first, but we also went set out to create an elite provider of the sort of, you know, mastermind accelerator for acquisition entrepreneurs. And, you know, what we do is we anchored in world-class education, um, you know, we added all the tools and resources and, you know, networks, you know, supplier network and all the rest of it. Uh, we, ha we currently have 14 different advisors with al almost a daily uh, advisory call. So you can get different perspectives um, on your deal and your search. And um, we call this the diamond uh, approach. Uh, and we have a vetted community. So only about 25 to 30% of applicants are actually extended an offer to enroll. Um, uh, you know, I think that few people come for the community but once you're inside, you sort of realize like this is a great group of people with common language, common goals, very active, um, all trying to change the world one acquisition at a time. So thanks so much and we'll see you on the inside.